Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel today on Arctic Indigenous Co-Productions. I'm Adriana Chartrand, the Institute Manager with Imaginative, and I'm so excited to present this amazing talk. We have some wonderful panelists and a great moderator for you today. And without further ado, let's get right into it. I'll hand it over to our moderator, Emil Perinar. Thanks, Adriana, and uh, welcome everybody uh, to this panel talk. My name is Emil, as Adriana said, and I'm a film producer from Greenland, uh, currently based in uh, in Copenhagen, Denmark, but still producing and doing a lot of different stuff and activities uh, regarding Greenland, regarding indigenous cinema, regarding the Arctic, and several projects with the panelists of today's talk, actually. So I think it's going to be a really nice and very familiar talk. Uh, and we'll try to uh, to 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 remain in in the friendly in the friend zone uh, for this entire talk. Um, and perhaps I should just like before I, I briefly introduce the panelists and have you say a little bit of, about the work that you do. Also, make a, a small disclaimer on all the different projects and ways that we are uh, connected uh, with each other across the the circumpolar Arctic and and the Nordics. So uh, we have from Raluit in Nunavut in Arctic Canada, Alicia Anarok Beryl and Stacey Aklock McDonald from Red Marrow Media. We have from Greenland, Uno Film and Polorama Greenland, Bibeluk Kreutzmann Jørgensen with us from Nuuk. And up from Sapmi and Lisa, are you in Kautokeino now or are you in Inari? I'm actually in Tampere, middle of Finland now. <laughs> okay, pretty close. But from the Finnish side of Sapmi, Lisa Holmberg from the International Sami Film Institute. And and just to to kind of make connect the dots, um, Lisa, you supported Bibeluk's first feature film, Anori, from the International Sami Film Institute. So there's that connection. Uh, Bibeluk is the director of a film currently being produced and in development by Red Marrow Media, produced by Alethea Anarkuk Beryl and Stacey Aglock mcdonald Stacey and Alethea are also co-producing a film called Twice Colonized that I produce in my company, Anorak Film. And then I have another company called Polorama Greenland, co-owned with Bibeluk Kreutzmann Jansen in Nuuk. So I think that's uh, the whole mysterious web of Arctic co-production right here in, uh, in, in this panel. Um, so, so starting with you, Alethea and Stacey, a quick introduction to what you're working on right now and what keeps you busy in Raluit. Oh my God, we have a board of all our projects. <laughs> uh, oh, you mean aside from the projects you just men mentioned? Um, um, we've the been main one we've been working on for a year. Yeah, we've been working on a comedy drama TV series, um, original concept. So we've been writing basically for a year and a half and um, still and writing. <laughs> spending way too much time together. <laughs> we can finish each, we write in collab mode with each other and we can basically like sometimes finish each other's thought yeah. or sentence. In writing. <laughs> she'll have a, she'll pitch a joke in the document and then be, be like, oh no, that's terrible. Delete, delete, delete. And I'll be like, no, no, that was good. Leave it in there. <laughs> so we're kind of a mind meld by now. Um, so there's the comedy drama, which is not in production. It's not picked up anywhere, but we're working on it. Um, Stacy's working on a feature script as well. Do you want to talk about it at all or? Um, yeah, it's also still in very early development and I have to, it's basically a first draft is due by the end of this month and I'm going to start tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. She's exaggerating a bit. She's exaggerating a bit. I'm just kidding. Oh, We've like, done a lot. <laughs> We've done the research uh, trip interviewing um, residential school survivor. Yeah, it's basically, a, it's a residential school love story. So um, about two kids, cause you know, so often uh, my mom's a residential school survivor and she was in residential school from the age of six to 16. And so just wanting to make a film that's all about Yes, there's residential school, but what does it feel like from an inner perspective as a young girl trying to grow up, like having your first crushes, having your first love, becoming a woman when there's no adults around there to really help you go through that. It's just you and your friends going through it together. Um, so it's gonna be, um, it sounds 
very heartbreaking and it will be, but it's also going to be really light and funny because children always try to find joy when whatever is happening in their world. They try to find laughter and joy. So it's kind of a balance of that and very inspired by my mother's experience. Mm. Um, we have a film that's in post-production right now called Slashback that shot in 2019 in Peng, uh, but because of COVID, everything's really slowed down. So we're still kind of working on that and trying to get it done. That, well, that one's directed by Naila Inukshuk. Yeah, another Inuk filmmaker. Hmm. So from um, just a ball ball yeah. fact, <laughs> Marco, uh, <laughs> a rough estimate of, of all the productions that you have in the pipeline in, in Red Marrow Media now, how many are, are international co-productions and how many are uh, domestic Canadian productions? Just the two, the, the uh, This Road with Pipa Look and the Twice Colonized with, with you guys. Okay. Um, and there yeah. are first also, our first international co-productions Kind of going simultaneously so we're learning quite quite a lot as we go cool uh, going over to you in nuke then people look now that uh, they mentioned this road of mine can you tell us a little bit about the, the the work that you're doing at the moment and 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 what's keeping you busy yeah besides like starting up polarama green and then <laughs> then i have been i've been this lucky that i've been in Imaginator's screenwriting lab for a year. In 2020, I, for a whole year, we have developed my script with re these incredible writers, as well as the support of Imaginative and, and, and telling the first thing, like when me and Ali and, and Stacy know each other for like 10, 10, 11 years ago, when where we I actually just found some pictures where we where you tattooed me, uh, all the tattoo I had in my face and my hands and like so it's ten years ago and and we are always talked about how can we um, collaborate and and tell stories together and and what we did with the with this script is now that I have. I think I'm on my seventh draft or something. And we are almost at the final draft. We will be on this final draft very soon. I just got my notes from Stacy. So <laughs> I'm working, I'm working on them. But it is live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but this is a collaborative of it, it is really an important collaborative because this is what we want to do. We want to make an Inuit story that is uh, universal, but still have indigenous contents and indigenous filmmakers behind, like as producers and as director and, and a writer. But as the team as well, like the people that we surround us with when we are telling the stories, that is what the aim is for, is how can we most likely have like a whole indigenous Inuk team for, for this film. And already we have started, we have these three amazing producers, Jason Ryle is one of them, as the artistic director for Imaginator for several years, he's just a gone producer now uh, and, and producing, but um, the film is really, it, it is a period film set in Greenland and Iceland and, and Canada. So, um, but we are, we are at the final draft moment. So hopefully we're gonna close it soon and, and start funding this film. I think, and I think we're gonna dig a bit deeper into that project a little later on, but it's nice to, to hear that a lot of things are going on on both sides of the Davis Strait uh, in, in Canada, in Raluit and in Greenland in Nuuk. And then over to you, Lisa, in Tampara, in Sapmi. Uh, representative today of the International Sami Film Institute. If you can briefly talk about what you do at the Film Institute, but perhaps also try to set the scope a little bit for uh, for Arctic indigenous film collaboration, because you work with basically all the indigenous people around the circumpolar Arctic. Yeah. I'm working as a film uh, commissioner in the Sami Film Institute in Kautkeino. And we Sami people, we are living in four different countries. We are living in Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Russia. And we are totally 100,000 people. And we have nine 
or actually 10 different dialects in the Sami language. And now we have started to dubbing mm, the children animated films. And it's uh, always a big question in which, which Sami language. <laughs> so it is not enough if we are dubbing in Sami language like North Sami, which is the majority Sami. Now we are dubbing in two or three other Sami languages also. We are building a studio in Kautokeino for digital um, sound studio and also editing. And uh, um, then there is this, uh, there is, um, I'm just giving answers now, not the questions. So the answer is Arctic Indigenous Film Fund, which is which we have uh, launched 2018 with uh, uh, you guys in Greenland, in Nunavut, Film Corporation, and Sundance Institute, and uh, Canada Media Fund, and also the Russian Saha Film, and. That's the, there is the answer again, when you are asking, I'm not asking the question, but I'm answering. <laughs> so that uh, how these uh, Arctic indigenous stories could be to the screen and what can we do together? As you said, Emil, we have done already many years together things, but now we, we, we created this Arctic Indigenous Film Fund to, to coordinate this cooperation, to collect funding and to being as a gateway to the bigger world. So it is in the beginning, the work, work is beginning. So it is a fund which is supporting all the Arctic indigenous film workers, not only in the Scandinavia, but also in Alaska, Canada, Greenland and Russia. So, and there are always this question, how we can reach to the Arctic indigenous communities. It's not only the filmmakers, but also this, um, researchers and those things. So we have a project with the York University where we want to launch the Arctic Indigenous Film Academy where, the, where we could have the degree programs and the research programs and so so-called witness program where we can make ourselves those documentary films up in the Arctic. Because I think of course, the money is the key, but also education is the key. We have to educate our own people, not only in the workshops and uh, some sort of uh, little courses, but the real high academic degree programs. That's our goal. Mm. A, lot of a lot of different and, and very interesting and important initiatives. Um, and I'm, of course, also very interested in the fact that you mentioned that, for instance, the Arctic Indigenous Film Fund is for Arctic Indigenous people all over the Arctic and not specific to any one so-called nation. Uh, I always love how you say these, uh, I'm in so-called Finland or in so-called Norway or so-called Sweden. I mean, the Samis are all over these, these countries and and were there long before there was a thing called Norway or there were the, these colonial borders that I think we will talk about a lot today. Um, can you tell us a little bit, Lisa, about how you as Sami people deal with this obstacle of being separated across colonial nation borders uh, and how you work together with film in that context? Yeah. Uh, the borders now, when this Corona time, now we can see the borders. Like I can't, I have to stay in Finland. I can't go to my office to so-called mm -hmm. Norway. <laughs> so to go out again or so. Um, but, the, but the thing is that the culture, the language, the livelihood, like reindeer herding, that it has been here 10,000 years. So way before there were those nation states like Norway and Finland and Sweden. So it is very, 
it is a rich culture. And um, so we, are, we, we have uh, lots of friends and relatives in the other side of those borders. So it is very natural that we are we're moving across the border. So in this filmmaking, it has been also, it is quite natural that we have a producer in Finland and the, the script, uh, the director in Norway, and in that way, or we can have co-productions in all three countries like Sweden, Sweden, Norway, and Finland. And in, as you know, they have a, in Finland, Sweden, and Norway, there are the state-owned uh, film institutes who are funding mm. the, the films in in these countries. So, so just to to make it crystal clear, at you as a as a film institute, as a Sami film institute situated in Norway, you have the mandate to support Sami filmmakers, whether they are from Norway, so-called Norway, so-called Sweden, so-called Finland, etc. Yes, yeah. But what it happens if, if then, if, if someone, if a Sami film director uh, who's based in Norway wants to apply for funding in the state film bodies, that can then only happen in Norway, or do you have any way of working around that border of conflict? Uh, yeah, you have to have, if I'm a Sami film director and a producer, and I'm located in Finland, it is very difficult to me to uh, get the funding from Norwegian Film Fund, but then it must be a co-production with Norway. And the, but that's a, in the way that's also a positive thing to go across the borders. But that what is not a positive thing is that when we are making a long films, a, a more e um, expensive films like a feature length films then we are depending on these national film funders and then they are they they don't understand our stories mm. they, they are saying but this is not a norwegian story or this is not a finnish story they are not they are sami stories and that's a problem because uh, they they don't they, it is very difficult to get this kind of storytelling, mm, like a traditional storytelling, like we have Sami people, to go into that block which they want, like Finnish mm. Film Foundation or Norwegian. Mm. And that's why we need our own funding. Yeah, and, and, and now it's it's in place and hopefully there will be, uh, it will be operational uh, hopefully before too long. But is, do you know, Lisa, if there are any initiatives happening to change the way that the Scandinavian film institutes work on this particular issue? Yeah, we have been, yes, they, there are some positive response. They, they, are, they are trying to listen to us. <laughs> they, they want to have meetings with us and they are trying, but the, the, the answer is to them always that we can't dictate what kind of films Finnish Film Institute or Swedish or Norwegian Film Institute are, uh, are, are funding. So, but we are saying, but we are not dictating, we are trying to help you to understand our storytellers because mm -hmm. our storytelling is um, different and it's creating our future. So that's why it's very important that we, we can tell our stories by ourselves. But yes, there is a little bit more positive response and uh, we have got many years now from Finland also funding to the, our film institute, which is located in Norway. But the most of funding is coming from Norway. Sweden is not uh, ready yet <laughs> for funding us, but hopefully soon. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Lisa. And, and I want to take that conversation a little bit uh, further west towards Greenland and, and Canada. And, and just now we've established the Samis as a 
one one of the only indigenous people in in Europe uh, situated across the, the the northern Arctic parts of, of Scandinavia and in Russia, uh, and and similarly in in the North American continent and on Greenland we have uh, the same people basically Inuits uh, across Alaska Canada and Greenland, and so starting with you Alicia and Stacy, uh, what uh, and Russia, of course, but uh, starting in, on the North American continent, what have been your learnings? Now you, you, you've basically we've been the same people always, but we're only starting to co-produce now. Uh, and and when we're talking about it right now, you're saying you have two co-productions. We're all in the same room, uh, more or less. Uh, so this is literally a thing that is just starting up now. Um, so what are the challenges that you have faced in terms of, of, of these borders? Well, first I would say, you know, one's a true co-production uh, and that's twice colonized with your, your company, Milliners. Um, with Bipa uh, project, um, she's the writer director and we're, uh, she's also a producer, but um, you know, she was hoping to focus more on the creative um, side of the project and uh, let us take uh, some of the burden of producing. And, and so it's an unusual um, project and our colonial funding systems don't really know how to handle it um, because, you know, we're in the film industry, the producers own the project, right? They, they um, the, the company owns the project and the majority of the funding has to come from the place where the majority of the um, ownership of the project is. And so we're in this position where, um, you know, our, our funding structures in Canada expect our writer and director to be Canadian. Um, and we're like, okay, but we're the same people and people who actually lives physically closer to us than our colonial government does. Um, like we, we feel closer ties um, with Greenland than we do with Ottawa in Canada. So um, we, don't, we don't feel that we should be prevented from working within our own people um, because of colonial borders. And uh, Canada doesn't have a co-production treaty with Greenland. It has one with Denmark, the colonial government, but it's very important to people look that we um, you know, sidestep the colonial uh, system, which as, as Emil and people who can probably describe much better than us, that the Danish system doesn't really support Greenlandic filmmakers anyway. So we're kind of in this void um, that policy hasn't caught up to yet. Um, we're trying to work with the Canadian government to, I feel like we're making progress, exciting progress, but I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> um, that they may be willing to do a pilot um, project that will allow uh, us, because we're from the same, you know, in their term, nation, um, um, as anyway, we don't use that term as much as the First Nations in Canada, but um, we are the same people. Um, our argument is that we should be allowed to work uh, with each other in the same way we'd work with any other Canadian. So we, we think we should be allowed to deem people look as a, as a Canadian, <laughs> uh, it's such awkward um, terminology, but when you're working with the uh, funding structures that are written in a way where, you know, it takes an act of parliament to, um, to change the, the wording in some cases, because the influence of American television in Canada is huge in the world, um, but the Canadian um, funding structures are extremely strict in trying to encourage um, Canadian owned projects and Canadian creativity and Canadian stories, which is fair um, because the States is right there and so many of our people work in the American industry. So um, to try to protect Canadian identity is something that I, you know, I, I can understand, but it inadvertently makes it more difficult for indigenous uh, people living on, on in so-called Canada um, to work with our own people. So they're, you know, it's it's not just like producing a regular project where like, oh, I have a great idea. I'm gonna pitch it to the funders and get money. We, we're having to change policy and try to 
um, to get that policy change enacted in, by act, an act of parliament, which is no, no easy thing. And it's taken many years uh, of lobbying to try to get done. And, and Canada is about to ch uh, change the, um, make a lot of changes with the Broadcast Act. And we're just really anxious to see if what we've been begging for for the last decade, so we can work with people look <laughs> um, to see if it actually uh, comes through. What is the status on that, Alethea, if, if, if you can share any of that? And, and who do you have pushing this agenda? Uh, I mean, it's, it's you're up against not only changing the law, but basically changing the fundam the like the fundamental, you know, uh, consensus on nation uh, definitions. It's been a multi-pronged approach. I mean, it's been years of every chance we got, uh, whether it's the, the, the national government uh, in Canada, the federal government uh, coming here to Nunavut for consultations on cultural policy or the, the CRTC, which is the regulatory body, the national regulator, regulatory body for television and radio, um, um, doing consultations on the Broadcast Act. Uh, when the Canada Media Fund, which is the, the major um, national funding body for, for television, or Telefilm, which is the national funding body for feature films, um, or territory, uh, you know, the, our, our territory within Canada, uh, all the different funding structures. Every four years, the government changes and you have to lobby new politicians and new deputy ministers and so on. So it's been like um, a decade of just plugging reminding it here people and there. Yeah. And saying literally like, the, the two of us want to work with people, look, Here's what needs to change to make that happen. And we just constantly remind everyone we can remind and we've developed relationships with the, the leaders of these various funding agencies and just remind them constantly. And this, this honestly, in, in the next couple of weeks, we should know whether um, those changes have been made to allow us to work together. Um, it's really imminent. It's, it's an exciting time in Canada right now for indigenous filmmakers to see what changes are going to be made to the Broadcasting Act in terms of supporting Indigenous language um, projects, but also, as, as we've been arguing for a long time, opening up colonial borders so that people within one nation can work together. And there's been a lot of hesitation because of the American border, and there are lots of First Nations and uh, Indigenous people, peoples that um, have lands that cross the Canadian-American border as well. And there's concern about um, if they change the policy to accommodate us, that it might open up all kinds of um, massive American projects uh, that will, you know, be predatory on the Canadian system. So it it's, um, I mean, I think they're very manageable problems, but it, it's it's something that it's taken convincing, um, you know, with with the federal government to to consider. So we're hoping that they're going to get over that fear and allow us to work together. I think also like having like the Nuke International Film Festival, the Nunavut Film Summits, where we actually get to invite a lot of those decision makers or people who have, um, you know, a foothold into those those situations where they can be a voice for us. Having them come to us, to our homelands, to see us as like Galahli Mute, Greenlandic Inuit, and Nunavut Inuit working together in those sum, the sum, these summits that we have and then the Nuke International Film Festival, it makes it so obvious and like sure that we're the same people, we share the same stories and that we are clicking and so obviously wanting to work together, having, bringing, being able to have opportunities where we can bring those people into those situations in our homeland is, has been very helpful, I think, in, in fighting for our and getting them to listen to us huge yeah that's really interesting and, and a, a huge endeavor and something that can turn out revolutionary for how you you how, how we can collaborate on on films uh, let's it's, it's going to be exciting for in the in the near future to see what happens and whether this new idea and this new system can trickle down to to you and satmi and to other places where people are locked in in uh, in these narrow uh, nation definitions um, I'm also thinking that it's interesting how we in like the, the Western world, when we talk about co-production, it's always a lot 
about financing and figuring out how to access different money pots in different countries and and you know then working with people out of necessity uh, to be able to access these money pots and and this seems to be the, the complete uh, reversed situation it's not about the money it's about the collaboration uh, and i and i and, and just to be able to actually work together uh, so i would like to to ask you Bibe Luke, as the writer and director of this project how you feel about uh, this process of pushing this uh, this agenda in in the project mm. yeah it's like like we have advocating for for um, for the danish system that we have like the danish uh, film institute to try to we have worked for that for before me there were it's 20 years right so so someone did it for 10 years and another for five or six years and then we did it for like and it was just enough like if they don't want to support greenlandic our storytelling and we were trying to always like in other projects as well try to adapt okay now i need a a cinograph from finland just to get the money from the nordic fund it's like that is that is crazy so now there is a momentum of, of this, like we are in a really good momentum now that we know, okay, if we're gonna tell these stories, we have to collaborate, like, and we need to find that structure. And that structure is um, like Lisa and Sapmi, like we have looked so much up to and, and, and with the Canadian fund system, they're so open to the, uh, with their Nunavut film development, we have looked so much into how did they do that and they have access to Canadian funds and so forth. So um, what was the question, Emil? No, just if, uh, if you have any thoughts on, on your role in changing the system through yeah. your own film. And, and I mean, also, why is it even important to collaborate? What, what can come out of these cooperation, collaborations? Yeah, because like when I was in the screenwriting lab, we would just suddenly see to tell a story is when you are so, um, it's not because we are so similar that we just understand the story, right? It is, but it is, there is this humor in the film that is different if you sit with a, another outsider or what do you say? Like, like there's just an understanding on, okay, this, of course, we are making notes and doing it better and, and I have different opinions on the script. But the story is that we understand the culture so deep, everyone. So we don't, there is not these 10,000 questions you have to answer to one like a sentence in a script. Like that takes time. So now we have actually an understanding on the culture and try to make a, a universal modern period film and like and it's that is and it's just um we want to change that game because i wanted to because when i went to alifia and stacy 10 years ago it was because okay how can we tell stories together but the structure of the funding we 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 met up with um yeah but but it's we want to change it and if it's me going in the Canadian and Nunavut film development because they're supporting of my story, then I go there because we, we want to lift up each other. But one thing there is missing is the Greenlandic government doesn't, like they support us with some money in, in, in telling the story, but they need to open up even more in, in the political environment to try to see, okay, if a Greenlandic, Inuk, director, uh, screenwriter, producer is is going and and get all the funding from Canada and as an Inuk, like we need to like there is be there have to be a bigger picture and our politician doesn't have that yet. So hopefully there is a, a election now going. So hopefully there will be a change because we have to open up to the co-production treaty and somehow it's working much more for us. It's working good, like as it is now, it says of the kingdom of, 
of Denmark that is Greenland too, but but it have to open up for more. Yeah, for for the story as well. But it's but I it, it will change. I'm so glad that they are advocating and Lisa is advocating and and it is right when we go out to Berlinale and we all meet and we are in the same uh, environment together to talk co-production internationally. But when we invite them actually to go to these our hometowns, then so the, it's a game changer. So and so thank you to Hugh as well in Nunavut Film Development to to open up that door for us to meet as well as we invite you guys to Nuke International Film Festival because it is the place where you're actually going to see uh, indigenous cinema and, and you're gonna talk about it in a higher level. Mm. Definitely good to have allies. And I think what you also mentioned about finding this kind of unity or understanding uh, is something that I think we've all experienced for the first time at some point, like going to a festival with indigenous people and screening our films there and, and you know, meeting this kind of understanding that you're not used to, uh, to, to experience from non-indigenous audiences. Uh, and I, I've certainly had, have had that experience myself watching Alethea's film Angry Nuke at Imaginative a few years ago and, and coming up to, to Sapmi for the Indigenous Film Conference, uh, like literally exactly three years ago to the day, I think, as we're sitting here talking. Um, so I'm just wondering, Bibelu, from, from your point of view, because you meant you, you've been on the road in Canada with theater plays before uh, you even started making films. And that was when you met uh, Alethea and Stacey and a lot of other uh, Canadian Inuit. Um, so I was just wondering what kind of realization does that make? How, what, what made you see the potential of working together or collaborating? Yeah, it was really because <laughs> when we did that and I just uh, gone, I, I, I had my 40 years old birthday. So it's a lot of, uh, oh, what have I done and where should I go? And like, <laughs> so I was actually looking at all these pictures that we like 10 years ago and suddenly you see, okay, we actually have changed many things in, in these five years. But at that time, it was really for my actors to, and for me myself, to explore like uh, First Nations in Ottawa and Anishinaabeg. And, and I wanted to go there to, to see how our culture can uh, collaborate uh, and that, and we did a documentary about it, uh, but we, as well as we did theater. But when we came to uh, Nunavut and like it, it's just something there because we, it's so similar, it's very similar. And what we want to do with this film is, it is in Galatlisut. We are so fortunate here in in Greenland that every we have our first language is Galatlisut, like it is Greenland. There's still like these, we still speak Danish too and so forth, but we have really a written strong language that is so, um, it's so good for us to to have that. And and what it is in, in Nunavut and Nukiluit is something that is, is coming back now and I have to like suck more in uh, to have the language. So, I hope with them, with this film, because it is it a Galatlisut film, uh, it, it, they're going to speak Galatlisut. It's going to open so much for our communities that this is a produced, uh, like, because people will see on the screen and they will understand what they're saying. Um, and, and, and that in an international way, like that is just really, my goal as well and when i i'm come i'm coming to a Qaluid, it's always like okay how can i try to not how can i try to learn more about these dialects uh, and 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 it is um i think it's 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 going to be nice to have that like we it, it is a film for the world of course but it is a film for our communities as well Alethea and Stacey, do you remember when you discovered Greenland as a potential place to do collaborations? We were trying to figure out how to move there. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, we've had whole plotting conversations about how we can go and spend a year, a year in Nuke. <laughs> Learn, learn their dialect. Uproot our families and we're like, we're just going to go there. <laughs> um, the desire is strong in our communities to engage with each other. And you see it, you know, every, how, when's the Inuit Circumpolar Conference? Is it every four years? I every think? four years. Yeah. And uh, people get so excited to be able to travel and, and engage with Inuit from other regions and um, it, it's this desire to learn about each other's experiences with different colonial governments and how that's played out and you know uh, what people look was saying about um, the funding structures um, like our, our film funding structures are more developed here in Nunavut but Greenland has this incredibly rich history of theater um, and you know our, our theater um, uh, world here in Nunavut is is uh, flourishing now, but 10 years ago when we first met people, look, it wasn't, um, it, it didn't exist. So, um, and, but, but we had all kinds of um, film training going on. We had all kinds of really exciting film training initiatives happening here at the time. And now uh, in Greenland, you guys have worked on uh, creating your, your film workshop. Um, so we've really learned from each other um seeing what what other uh jurisdictions are doing and and going hey we could do that too and and we start developing it so i mean the music industry in greenland is incredible and so you know each region has different strengths and when we can collaborate with each other it just levels up all of our all of our work um and, and the development of our various infrastructure needs as well so and hearing about Lisa's, um, the Sami Film Institute working across four colonial uh, governments is just like, it's mind boggling to me. I mean, that's what we need for Inuit as well, right? Like if, if we had an Inuit film fund um, or, or if it was like part of the, the art of film fund where Canada and the States and Greenland and, and, and I think Denmark, even though Greenland is, is separating from, from Denmark, I think Denmark has a responsibility to um, fund uh, Greenlandic culture because they spent so so damn long trying to crush it. Uh, it's the least they can do, in my opinion, to um, to contribute to the to the um, the ma maintenance and, and strengthening of of Greenlandic culture. So it's it's exciting to see what's possible in other jurisdictions and, and especially when you're working with colonial governments and you're constantly being told though that's not really possible there are these barriers here and there and everywhere and then it, it's just so great when you can say well actually they just they did it over there so it's not impossible <laughs> um it it really helps exactly um lisa i'm i'm just thinking about you know what 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 alethea is saying and and the fact that you know so much has has happened in in, in the past just few years uh, i mean now we're not able to to sit in the same room right now but three years ago we we had this huge conference in kausikino that you organized for arctic indigenous filmmaking basically um so being one of the driving forces of bringing arctic indigenous filmmakers closer together how do you see the next couple of years ahead and and how how can we how can we build on this wave that that is starting and and these things that Alethea talk about talks about about you know in being inspired from each other and learning from our successes and, and trying to adapt do you see any any very any like important pivotal focus areas we should focus on yeah I I can see it um Positive. I think we are, as you said, in some years we have done a lot. Like people who said in 20 years happened almost nothing. And then little by little we are, because you they can't stop us. <laughs> it is like, uh, because they can't stop us to be friends, to be colleagues, to be and cooperating, even though if they are not giving us funding or it, it, it making it very difficult to me to seeing, for example, Alethea's Angry Enoch, that film, very 
beautiful film from your own village there. And I was at the same time trying to uh, to negotiate the European Commission to to listen to us Sami people and the uh, Arctic indigenous peoples because we don't have any sayings there. So I saw that film and I was thinking, yes, that, <laughs> this is it. You should, all the people in the European Commission, European Parliament should see this film. This is what we are talking, why you are making these kind of decisions over us uh, and just making beautiful words. Why can't you support us to make these kind of films, to make the bridge to those villages, to make the Alatea's word, the people looks and everybody's words to, to the world. So I think we are in the right way and we are going to be stronger and we will because there is this uh, big need also to see different stories and they are telling to us your stories you have so many untold stories actually they are not untold we have been telling them to each other <laughs> eight thousand years but the First time we will put them in the screen, in the bigger screen or these little screens of where, yeah. wherever we are telling them to. And there is a big need to these stories. We have seen, for example, frozen to the Disney, big giant Disney animation studio. They wanted to collaborate with Sami people not because they wanted to collaborate with us. They wanted to have this story. They wanted to have a really good story. And they got with us Frozen 2, box office, $1.5 billion made it to, to Disney Studios. So this kind of signs, you can see that our stories are they people want to hear and see our stories so that's why we are going to mm. keep on working and we will be stronger together there's a there's a bit of a like a, a shift uh, in in how how we are perceived i think internationally or at least it's it's getting there right i've i've been pitching on the documentary pitch forum in Tromsø a few times and Lisa you are always in the among the decision makers and and I love it every time that you have non-indigenous filmmakers coming up there to pitch a project that takes place in a small community in the Arctic and they always start in the middle of nowhere and <laughs> the decision makers objecting it's not the middle of nowhere for those who live there um, and I and I think Basically, for us as well, I think the, the, the world is getting smaller and, and we can communicate with each other through this. We can keep track of each other on social media. So we also, you know, we form these ideas of, of collaborating and working together more and, and, and trying to figure out ways that we can, that we can do that. Um, and, and I want to also point the question towards critical mass. And, and you mentioned, Lisa, that you want to build a, a, a film academy uh, for Arctic indigenous people. How big an issue, and I'm really now addressing the whole panel in your various regions, how big an issue is uh, competencies or qualifications or technical skills in the film communities in terms of keeping this uh, wave alive? Who wants to go first? I can go first because I think the competence, like we can teach our people to, to film and edit and screenwriting and everything that, but also we need the academic people to analyze, to say what are our stories, how they have been told, how they should tell, um, you know, this kind of a deep, um, deep uh, academic work which is now lacking or if it's then it's non-indigenous who are analyzing us again and i don't like it <laughs> I, I want to have ourselves when we are writing to the paper our analyze and it's academic paper then it's 
then it's true. <laughs> what did you want to say something, Pibeluk, about this issue? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I think it's um, what we are, of course, with this project, it, it, there is an aim for half, like all from the technical part to the composer to the, like everyone, it had to be like, you know, or indigenous or, or what we come up with. But what we are seeing now is that we have given, it's so good that we have the film workshop here in Greenland now, the youth is coming in to, to have film, but it is important to, when these stories that we have, it's not, the, it's two ways because the one part of me is studying Polarama and we are getting all of these international production. They have a story from their set in Greenland and, and, and suddenly we're going to be the cultural ambassador for how to, okay, maybe you should not say that or maybe it could be like this. And in the other way, I'm just like, okay, we have to sell our own stories and we have to do it like this and this and this. But the one thing that we started Polorama is that we want to educate hands-on on being on film sets, to be like, to take over and, and have the people that actually can be um, uh, first AD, like all these things. So we are not only assistants. So we want to build up hands-on in Greenland at the moment. And we ha are starting in the university to talk about uh, the different we have a culture line and 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 have film in 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 there too in the university to have the academic part as well like we advocating from that as well uh, but I think the like we we want to tell our own stories and we have to do it in this collaborative way but if each project have to take 10 years then it's like ugh. like so we need to, it have to be a little faster right like you have to be okay this is a director that actually can do something this is a producer that can't do something let's do this now because the momentum the creativity the the power is there now so not, let's not wait for like five more years or something to, okay, maybe the structure can be like this or this or this. Like we need people like Lisa with my own film that I've done it for 200,000 euro, the whole a, a feature film. But she came in with 100,000 kroner and saved the whole thing because she believed in the director and the producers. And we are really good when we, are this group. So there have to be this not waiting academically for to try to change things for 10 more years. We already have said all that with so many reports and now it have to show, like we have to, we have to have the film on the screen so the audience can say, okay, can I relate? Maybe this is bad story, so no, I'm not going to watch it, but let us at least have it on the big screen for them to judge the work. Yeah, I, I have always said that we must have the right also make bad films. Yeah. <laughs> All the films must be in Venice Film Fest. We can make bad films also, so, but yeah. all the time film. Yeah, all the time, exactly. Alethea and Stacey, what, 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 what is your take on, on this? Because I think it's, it's also a matter of, it's been taking so many years to pry the camera from the white man's hands, right? I mean, to just be, be able to, 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 to do it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to look at the different models. Like, you know, in, in Nunavut, um, there was no infrastructure when we started out and we worked on a lot of uh, productions uh, like as assistants, um, productions that came from away from the south, from in, from non Inuit uh, that came into our homeland to make films, and we kind of latch onto their projects to get training. Um, and then when we, as we lobbied our our government for training funds, we we did a very like basic introductory level workshops. We did a lot of those. We did lots and lots and lots of those, and. 
um, in hindsight, I, like I, I find it really interesting the model that uh, the Sami in Institute has uh, gone with, which is to take storytellers and support them as individuals instead of doing like really wide casting the net really wide to to train uh, hundreds of people in in like entry level skills. They've taken a handful of really creative. Uh, powerful storytellers and and given them teams of all already really experienced um producers and, and crew and all of that uh, so it, it's a very different approach and they've produced world-class films um and not to say that we, uh, we haven't as well but it, it's interesting to see the two different approaches and and uh, i think there's a lot to be said for both um strategies but it's just something to keep in mind that i think I think colonial governments tend to be like, oh yeah, let's just put a, a an eye support for you know taking somebody who's experienced and just has gaps in their knowledge, or um, you know we really need sound design, <laughs> sound uh, people um, on our productions, and we don't have any like to do targeted, careful, professional level training. It's harder to find support for. Um, I find so it's it's uh, I really like the Sami model of of training um, mm. and when you talk about uh, training academics as well, Lisa, I really um, appreciate that because it's you know we Inuit art in Canada has been famous for decades um, and kind of like fancy <laughs> rich people like to buy Inuit art, but we had very so many artists and we had very few curators, um, very few Inuit working galleries, you know, deciding what kind of art gets made and bought. And there's power in in having uh, control at that level as well. So I think it's really important to have to be developing the storytellers, but also to be developing the, you know, the film festival pro programmers and uh, that kind of thing. So it's just it's so cool to see what people look um, and you all have done with the Nuke Film Festival uh, developing uh, people who know how to program a festival that that's really important skill set as well. So um, yeah, different strategies across the board. And once again, we're learning from each other on, on what what is valuable. Mm. Yeah, that's so cool. And and I think I mean, they've done a lot of Stacy's work. Sorry. Uh, um, something that we've also found uh, foreign service productions coming into our lands to make films are really great training opportunities, but also something Stacy's done um, worked really hard at is to develop TV series uh, and not just like one off films um, because series are ongoing and you can find steady consistent work with that and so she's really developed a lot of crew um, through the Hanuli series that uh, she and, and uh, the guys uh, did with that comedy show all in Inuktitut. So it, you know, it developed crew, everything from actors to camera department to hair and makeup and everything. So when we got to the point where we're working on feature film productions, she's got this whole like Rolodex in her head of, of Inuit uh, cast and crew that are ready to go because they worked on their comedy show. So um, having series work is also really important to developing um, an industry. Um, so that it's not just one feature film every three years or something, you know. Right. Amazing, amazing stuff. And I think it's it, it all. I mean, comes down to control and ownership, basically, of the of the institutions as well. I mean, we cannot expect change to come from the outside. I think we've all witnessed many times, uh, like um, people coming in with best intentions, making films in the Arctic. Uh, and and leaving and saying here, this is the film we made about you. Here you go, uh, and and that's just not enough any longer. I mean, we need to 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 learn the tra the trade and the craft, and and of course to tell our own stories. And and it's been really wonderful to hear some of the thoughts you have on on how to do that and how to how to collaborate because. We can't uh, neglect that, that the Arctic is, is hot now, and, and we have a we have a momentum that we should use. Um, so I would just before we end, how, for for audiences that, that who's watching this, how can how can people engage with you or help you out or follow the process or, or chip in for the Arctic Indigenous Film Fund? If we start with you, Lisa, where where do people find you? Where do we send our checks? <laughs> You can go to our website, 
it is the it is our film in the institute's website www.esfi.no uh, or aifa.no and all so there we are and there is possibility to donate <laughs> money also it's the easiest way but we we are we are happy to have all kind of um, uh, support for our work everything is welcome mm. We will keep track of that and, and Alethea, Stacy, and Bibe, look, where when do we hear news about this project and whether or not it will be able to change the, the, the film funding system in among Inuit? Well, so we expect the, the broadcast act and some of the details around that to come out. It could be any day, uh, but hopefully within the next couple of weeks. But it, once that's announced, if it does go our way, then we're, we still have the regular process that we have to apply for the film funds it would just open the door to make us eligible to apply um, and if that's the case then you know it, it's still months away but to hear answers on the, the funding proposals um, but it's the, the decision of whether or not we'll be allowed to apply we're hoping to know more in the next two weeks hmm. fingers crossed on that and good luck to all of you and thanks so much for this conversation Alicia Amakou Beryl, Stacey Aklak McDonald from Radioid Nunavut, Biba Luke Kreutzmann Jansen from Nuuk in Greenland and Lisa Holmberg with us from Tambara in Sapmi in, on the so-called Finnish side. Thanks so much for being here all of you. <laughs>